Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us from all parts of the world. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Abbas Kadam. I am the director of the Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is an Iraq Initiative uh, Middle East Programs um, event. Uh, I am honored to host His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Ali Al-Hakim um, in an event, uh, a conversation that cannot be more timely. It is just hours ahead of an important uh, U.S.-Iraqi uh, dialogue that is about to uh, take place uh, in the uh, coming uh, days, and it will last for a um, quite a time, uh, so we might even think about it being a multi-year dialogue. If uh, we were to look at a strategic uh, dialogue, we will talk about that. Uh, but before this, uh, this is an event uh, on the record. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, in initially thank the uh, communications team and the Middle East program team at the Atlantic Council for bringing us to you uh, through this technological uh, uh, media. Uh, I will uh, also would like to ask you to, um, after we, we get to the questions and answers, to type your questions in the question and answer um, section on your screen. Uh, and before we start, uh, allow me to introduce uh, His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Ali Hakim. Uh, who has a very uh, extensive experience and an elaborate uh, CV that I will only use the, uh, a few highlights from it. Uh, Dr. Al-Hakim uh, just uh, was serving in the Iraqi government uh, until a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, he uh, was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in a very important time in Iraq's uh, history. Uh, he also uh, had a uh, long uh, uh, diplomatic experience uh, fr uh, from the uh, times that he was uh, in the uh, Iraq's representative to uh, the United Nations, and then uh, also uh, between 2003 and 2013, he was uh, the uh, Iraqi representative to the uh, UN in Geneva. Uh, he uh, was uh, an elected uh, official in Iraq um, when he served as a member of the National Assembly between 2005 and 2006. Uh, and uh, that uh, post was uh, the uh, part of the body that laid the ground for the first steps of uh, founding a democratic or democratized uh, Iraqi uh, state, and he was part of that effort. Uh, also, as a recognition and a distinction of uh, his uh, career and his experience, the UN uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General appointed His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Ali Hakim as the Executive Secretary of a uh, Economic uh, and Social Commission for Western Asia. Uh, a highly uh, important, highly coveted post, and he served uh, starting uh, April 2017 until he was called uh, by uh, previous uh, Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi to go to Baghdad and uh, serve as uh, his Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, a lot to speak about, uh, and his CV is well known and it is accessible to all of you. Um, so let us delve to the, uh, to the conversation. Your Excellency, welcome to the Atlantic Council. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, you were the first uh, Iraqi uh, cabinet member that I had the honor to host at the Atlantic Council um, in 2019. And it is so good to see you back. You always give us great insight, candid conversations, and uh, we benefit all from talking to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abbas, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, dialogue uh, between uh, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for the Iraqis. Thank you. Uh, the way we will go here, I will start uh, 
taking the uh, privilege of being the host and moderator to ask you a couple of questions. And then most of the conversation would be with the audience. Uh, we have a very distinguished group of uh, audience that joined us uh, from all parts of the world. And uh, we thank them for this. So my um, first question, and there are no easy questions for the um, uh, foreign minister uh, of Iraq or anybody who served in as an Iraqi uh, cabinet member. Um, we are, of course, uh, getting to a um, ready to, to following the important, uh, long-awaited uh, Iraqi-American uh, dialogue. I will uh, uh, talk to you a little bit later about it. But first, let me start with uh, asking you about what you brought to the Iraqi Ministry of Foreign Affairs and what kind of a, um, a, a, a legacy that you are leaving in terms of the uh, your, your style and setting the U.S. Iraqi, uh, sorry, the U.S. Iraqi relations and also the Iraqi regional relations and relations in general. Uh, I know that uh, during your tenure, even though it was very short, a little over a year, but there were important accomplishments the Iraqi Ministry of Foreign Affairs has uh, made, including memberships in uh, important UN committees, etc. So what uh, would you like to be remembered uh, in, uh, as Iraq's uh, foreign minister? Well, thank you, Dr. Abbas, and, and uh, um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, also good evening to uh, your viewers. And I'm delighted to be here with you as well. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And in essence, as you said, uh, my tenure at uh, the foreign ministry was rather short, uh, but it is an important period that we served under uh, the government of Abdel Mahdi. Uh, the government of Abdel Mahdi started as a reform of government, and that's really the idea of uh, uh, coming to work with Abdel Mahdi as a reformer and trying to sort of move after uh, defeating ISIS to the period of opening up uh, with our relationship. We had three primary goals at the foreign ministry uh, when I started. The first goal, these are also government goals that are set in front of the parliament. The first goal is to re-establish a good relationship and clear all of the issues with our neighboring countries. Turkey, we had issues with them, borders, water, etc. Also uh, Iran, we, we still have issues of borders and others. And then with Kuwait, uh, which is there are so many uh, UN Security Council, we, we clear them up. We still have uh, uh, certain issues with them. We need to clear them. Also, the second part of, of my primary goal was to establish uh, the, the, uh, the, the Arab uh, uh, regional depth of Iraq, is to go toward uh, the Arab region, work with the Gulf areas, as well as uh, uh, work with the Arab region uh, like Egypt and uh, Jordan. Uh, uh, the third goal is to, to open up to the European countries. And, and this is very important for us and to work with Brussels and make sure that we have a dialogue with Brussels and with the, with the European Union and also with our uh, friends, uh, the United States and uh, also China and Russia, as well as Japan and South Korea and India. These are sort of the goals that we established up front. Uh, and I started working on the international uh, issues uh, at the foreign ministry. Internally, we wanted to uh, work on issues of uh, putting the diploma diplomatic core into the right courses and the right training. So make sure that our diplomats are ready to go outside and serve Iraq and their embassies and their consulates. And this is really the goals that we had uh, to start with uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. And uh, I had the privilege of visiting the ministry uh, uh, a couple of times uh, during your tenure. And so a lot of uh, hard work that you have been working, especially on what you mentioned, uh, the um, uh, development of the cadre of the ministry. Uh, Iraq has a peculiar way, uh, well, maybe not peculiar in, in the region, but at least uh, from those who are in the West, is that um, you know it's very hard to appoint ambassadors to uh, to get uh, to serve uh, and the the last ambassador that was uh, appointed by the time we were you took office I think was in two thousand nine 
and then in your time we know we, you you filled some of these these positions and uh, uh, you were you were, you were talking about a uh, an elaborate agenda on how to um, bring up the capacity of the Iraqi diplomatic corps and I hope that uh, your uh, successor, uh, who is a good friend, uh, Dr. Fuad Hussein, you just congratulated him uh, yesterday uh, or the day before, and uh, we hope that he will also follow on on that hard work uh, that you laid uh, down for him. Uh, let's let's move to uh, then uh, talking about uh, the uh, what is on everybody's mind: the U.S.-Iraqi uh, dialogue. Uh, and uh, I know this is an issue that is very sensitive, but definitely your uh, insight on it is very important. Uh, the, it is coming in a time that is uh, kind of uh, very rough for Iraq uh, for three reasons I can think of, but there are many others. One of them is that uh, Iraq is facing uh, much bigger problems uh, uh, domestically. Uh, the, uh, uh, the economic crisis that was brought down by uh, or brought upon Iraq by the, um, uh, the the collapse of oil prices, which is an exogenous factor. Iraq had no hands in it. Same thing with the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, which is a global uh, challenge, and Iraq was one of the countries that are uh, coping with it, with it. And also the cumulative challenges that uh, have been uh, facing Iraq for a long time. And then this uh, talk, which is or dialogue, which is uh, controversial, but it is also highly important. It was initially set uh, when you were in office, and I remember that you were the first to announce it. Uh, and uh, then uh, the the date was set, but uh, you, it, it became one of the issues that the new government inherited. The other issue that. I'm thinking of is that this is a government that just took office and only this weekend they completed all of the cabinet memberships. So to get ready for a dialogue of this importance and also with all of the division inside Iraq among the stakeholders on what is the end game, what are the acceptable goals, what can you tell us about initially what, how the dialogue was set uh, uh, to, to go uh, during your time and what uh, other uh, preparations, uh, if any, that were made, uh, that were turned over to the new government? And what, are your, what is your advice for, for the current cabinet to proceed uh, in, in this? These are several questions, but I think they are important. Very good. Uh, so, yes, as you said, first of all, I wanted to mention that the dialogue between us and uh, the United States has never stopped, really. We were in continuous dialogue. And this is a point specifically to execute an, on certain provision of uh, uh, the strategic framework agreement. And we were uh, nibbling on bits and pieces of these agreements on education, on technology, on security, we were also uh, working on uh, visa issues for uh, American citizens as well as for uh, business people and, uh, you know, multiple visas and so on. So we were actually dialoguing with, uh, you know, with, with our partners, the U.S., uh, during the past uh, year, year and a half on these issues. And um, as for uh, preparing, yes, uh, uh, in April, uh, we received a letter from the State Department uh, saying that uh, we are uh, ready to uh, start a dialogue uh, with, with, with the Iraqi government uh, on the issue of the strategic frame agreement, which is important for us. And uh, we send them a letter of, uh, we are welcoming uh, that dialogue. And, and I, I, I call it dialogue because here in the local groups and uh, papers, it says it's negotiation. We are not negotiating anything. The SFA is there. Uh, and it's an agreement, and the agreement is being passed by Parliament, and it's published agreement, and we signed by the two sides. The only things we need to do is figure out the bits and pieces on uh, the bigger sectors inside the agreement. And so during the Adel Abdel Mahdi's government, we start preparing uh, the team uh, that is going to lead that dialogue with the State Department and the U.S. And our team hasn't changed, by the way. The minister has changed. 
and a friend, uh, Dr. Fouad Hussein, came in. But the team itself uh, that is assembled by uh, the senior deputy uh, minister is already there. And um, uh, all, all of the pieces from uh, the other ministries like the uh, energy, uh, economics, uh, security, defense, uh, uh, and oil ministries and others are all going to be there assembled and they are all senior uh, uh, staff that is going to be uh, attending uh, on the 11th of this month. Would you think, if I may follow up on, on this, would you think that the uh, nature of the meeting, uh, virtual, not uh, all the people in the same room, going to um, be different? Uh, I mean, certainly it would be better to have everybody in the room, but would it be productive? And also, more importantly, do you think that uh, some uh, clear uh, objective or at least uh, accomplishments will be made in this run of a dialogue or the accomplishment will be actually getting the ball uh, rolling and starting the dialogue, which is also an important aspect as well. Well, it's actually both. Both of them is very important. You know, getting, getting the dialogue going is very important. And the second issue is how do we take advantage of the technology and make sure that we, during this talk, we will accomplish as much as we can and then we'll come out with the results that's being satisfactory to both sides. And that's why I think the division, uh, it's been, uh, we, uh, the, the, I know the team has put an agenda and that agenda is divided into sectors and these sectors will be then discussed individually as we go, we go along. Speaking of the strategic framework agreement, uh, it was signed in 2008. It was part of a pair of uh, agreements. One of them expired by the end of 2011, the security or the status of, of U.S. forces in, in, in Iraq. And then the strategic framework was what, what, what remained. Uh, the, the dialogue was announced to be based on it. Uh, but there are voices that say uh, this is an agreement that was signed during a different time and different circumstances. The type of the relations between Iraq and the United States were, were different. Um, is it still capable of serving uh, the, uh, the U.S.-Iraqi relations and the ambitions both sides have for robust relations? Or uh, is it warranted that the two sides use maybe this dialogue or plan through the dialogue for the opportunity to either raise this to the level of a treaty or at, at least uh, amend it in a way that will be closer to the requirements of the times, uh, more uh, addressing the, the current relations and the challenges. And we all agree that U.S.-Iraqi relations have witnessed a lot uh, between 2008 and 2000, uh, 2020 uh, and beyond. So. What would be your sense of this agreement and, and what the future of the relations in the, in, the, in the framework of legalizing these relations by whatever kind of, of agreement, treaty, or any other formality between the two countries? I think this is a good question. I think this is really the first 15, 20 minutes of the dialogue would be probably discussing these issues. Where do we go from here? Do we continue on the same path? Do we uh, initiate a new path? Do we initiate all of the options that you've mentioned? And I think this is really something that is going to be put right away in the first 10, 15 minutes to figure out where the two sides are uh, on this particular issue. Yes, it is signed uh, on 2008, but at the same time, uh, their sectors and, 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 and its core is still valid in terms of validity and importance to both countries. But how do we want to proceed? And I think this is really the first 10, 15 minutes of the dialogue will then uh, uh, establish this particular issue. Uh, and I hope so, because this is, uh, you know, I know if you were in the room, you probably would have uh, put that on the table up front. Uh, the question here is uh, also, if, if we were to still uh, stay with the, with the um, uh, strategic framework agreement, it was on the paper and reading its articles, uh, it was meant to be uh, very wide in its scope, uh, reaching several sectors and aspects of the U.S.-Iraqi relations. Um, the, uh, there was a 
small component of it, uh, important, uh, but small, that deals with the security and combating terrorism. But Iraqis uh, were, were told uh, uh, when the agreement was signed that this would be bringing other benefits to Iraq in terms of science, technology, uh, culture, economics, uh, uh, education, all kinds of other aspects. Now, uh, the, granted that the challenges that were happening after the signing of this agreement, and also particularly after 2014, um, they put a lot of emphasis on Article 1 that dealt with the, uh, with, with the uh, security issues. But many Iraqis don't see the other aspects being uh, taken care of from both sides. Now, there is a lot of work the U.S. is doing through USAID uh, with the IDPs, with uh, many other issues, training, etc. Sometimes it goes under the radar or different banners. But none of that has reached to the level of the average Iraqi to see those. All what Iraqis see from the United States Iraqi agreement including the strategic framework agreement, is that it is focused on security, combating terrorism, military issues, and sometimes occasionally business, especially in the oil sector. Uh, now, you were uh, the, the, the person to know all the details of that cooperation that is outside the stereotype of security and, and oil. What else that Iraqis need to know about? And also not just Iraqis, because even Westerners uh, send the or, or, or voice these concerns about this strategic framework agreement that has not been fully implemented or um, the, the wide scope of it was utilized. Well, I, th I think these are important issues. I think uh, a few things that we are right now uh, facing uh, heads on, which is, um, first of all, is the financial issues. Iraq is really with the oil prices down and we have a large public sector uh, Iraq is the largest public sector probably employed in, in the country, and this is really uh, an important issue. Uh, third uh, uh, is the issue of COVID-19, uh, where uh, Iraq is facing uh, uh, challenges in the health issues. That's where the United States and other countries are actually helping us in this. And uh, so, yes, the aspect of security, which is the first uh, sector, as you mentioned, is important. But our commitment to the coalition is very strong. Uh, on the 4th of June, which is a few days ago, there was uh, a meeting at the foreign minister level, also a digital meeting uh, uh, in Rome, hosted by the foreign minister of Italy. And the prime minister, Mustafa Al-Kadhimi, has delivered a, a strong message. And it's, he says Iraq is fully committed to the coalition of, of defeating ISIS. That means we are part of the coalition, we are a stronger part of the coalition, and we'll continue to be part of the coalition. So security, yes, important, but you will add two elements today that are very crucial, finance and the health. And these are part of uh, the SFA. And this is where the U.S. could actually assist us in both helping us with the international organization, uh, like the uh, you know IMF with the World Bank and others, and also helping us in the health, where they've already assisted us with a tremendous number of uh, money. And then also they help us with uh, uh, humanitarian issues. So there are a lot of issues that the U.S. has given us. They are not really under the radar. They are visible because the money is going to the right ministries and the ministries are actually, uh, you know, helping and assist other uh, Iraqis for it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, now, I will ask one last question and then turn to the audience. Um, and uh, this question will have to do with uh, something that I saw you many times emphasize and also admonish your uh, um, uh, cadre all the time to, uh, to remember and to use as the motto, which is Iraq's neutrality in terms of its foreign policy. Iraq probably more so from the times of uh, the government of Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi, and you faithfully, your administration faithfully followed that policy, which is a policy not to be in axis, uh, not to be part of uh, many of the conflicts, since you recognize that you are in a very 
conflict-prone uh, region, uh, not easy region to be part of, uh, and especially the conflicts that Iraq has no stakes in, and uh, sometimes uh, Iraq gets dragged into them because of the nature of the, uh, the, the participants in these conflicts. First of all, how hard was it for you as a prime minister and the head of, of the Iraqi foreign policy and for the, uh, sorry, as a, as a minister of foreign affairs and also for the prime minister and, and the council of ministers to steer Iraq away from these conflicts. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not asking an easy or a hard question, but we all remember that you faced probably one of the hardest challenges Iraq has had uh, in post-2003 uh, during the December of 2019 and, and January uh, 2020, where the situation was really uh, becoming a um, spinning almost out of control, and it took a lot of work uh, to extinguish many of these fires. How hard was it to maintain that or, or to at least get that attitude towards neutrality respected by the uh, regional and, uh, and international actors. Most of them are allies because, as you mentioned earlier, you pretty much uh, solved many of the conflicts and you turned most of the people that were skeptic about Iraq into friends um, you know, by your visits uh, and, and the previous uh, government visits to key capitals like Riyadh and, and, and others. Uh, how hard was it and what were the hardest memories that you have from those bruising days in August? Well, uh, Dr. Abbas, this, this requires, uh, you know, a, a, a full session to speak about the challenges, but... We are ready. Just tell us when you are available. What the job is all about. Honestly, I didn't think when I took this job it was an easy job to start with. And Iraq, uh, it's been in, 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 in war 40 decades, really. Never settled down and built on uh, you know, uh, its institution correctly. And I think what we needed to do is when we came in during Adil Abdel Mehdi's government, we thought that we would be doing more reform because we just finished from fighting Daesh and then all of the countries uh, supporting us, whether it's from uh, uh, the European, U US uh, uh, and other friends are helping us uh, to you know, settle down and, and relax and try to put priorities to our foreign policies. And I said the priorities is, is to make sure that we are dialoguing uh, successfully with our neighbors and also uh, make sure that we reach out to the countries like the Gulf countries, the Arab region, uh, uh, as well as uh, to the others to make sure that we open up. Uh, and Baghdad really in the first year was uh, sort of uh, a visiting capital by so many foreign uh, ministers, as well as uh, we were visited by a, trem a tremendous number of uh, head of states and foreign ministers. And this is really, uh, it gives you an idea how important Baghdad was in the first year of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mehdi's government. So it is challenging, but we, were, we went and worked through these pieces, piece by piece, and we wanted to sort of reach out to uh, the neighboring countries as well to the Arab region uh, and as well to uh, uh, the European and the US and other countries. Thank you. Uh, now let me turn to uh, the, the questions from the audience and uh, I might you know, follow up uh, on, on a few uh, answers, it depends. Uh, but there is one uh, question that picked on what you said in the beginning. Uh, when well, you mentioned that your government, uh, Dr. Adel Abdel Mahdi's government, was a government of reform. And the uh, question here says, what were the obstacles you faced while working on that reform? Uh, it's well, an easy but a hard question at the same time. It is actually a very good question. Most of the, most of the reforms that Adel Abdel Mahdi was trying to do in the institutions internally, and one of them was the foreign ministry. And I worked very hard on trying to reorganize the foreign ministry and make sure that our diplomats are set in the path that they could actually match the foreign diplomats when they go on missions or on assignments uh, overseas. And this is what the issues that we're trying to do. The second reform is really uh, not only institutional reform, but it's financial reform. How much it costs? Where is the money is coming from? How do we organize the money we have? 
And this is where Adel Abdel Mahdi trying to come in and work his economic magic to figure out how do we deal with this. Third, Adel Abdel Mahdi has a vision of opening up the private sector. And the best private sector in Iraq was the agriculture industry. So he's tried to go to the agriculture industry. That is a very good, and it's not an expensive industry to put money in and get output out, which is really very good. And that's why he went to the farmers and he worked with the farmers and actually did, you know, uh, for security, food security as well for Iraq and also production of agricultural production. That's why we are practically after a year, semi, uh, you know, sort of self-contained in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, import less of products from neighboring countries on agricultural products. So the reforms, we were all engaged, all cabinets. We had also uh, to report to the prime minister uh, uh, every week practically on the progress of what we've done. And then also we had uh, two reports to the parliament. It's called six months report on the progress that the government has done and a yearly uh, uh, report on what the progress the government has done in the reform of institutions. Adel Abdel Mahdi tried to fight corruption and corruption is one of the hardest issue in Iraq. And this is what he tried. And he tried to establish a methods and a system to put to fighting corruption uh, rather than bringing people into court. I think he was trying to build up a system where he figured out how do we build uh, uh, that system so we could uh, build on it uh, and fight corruption. And that's really the important part of the reform. And I actually, it was attracted to me when he spoke to me when I was at the UN and he said, our goal is to reform our institutions and move on with issues that is challenged in Iraq. Thank you. Um, we hope that the current government also will continue on that path, and especially now there is a momentum uh, towards that reform and to closing many of the loopholes. Uh, there is a, I think, if one thing Iraqis agree on uh, is that there is a need for reform, there is a need to end corruption. They might disagree on how to start and you know where to start and etc. But you know if there is anything that is needed, it's uh, you know it is that uh, reform and and uh, bringing transparency and integrity into the political process, so that the nation can be built both institutionally and also the infrastructure. Um, and and thank you for all of of the work I've. Again, I had the privilege of seeing some of your work during, because we worked closely with the ministry during your time. Um, and, and we hope that the next government, uh, and, and we have expectations and also confidence that they will do that as well. A uh, question that says um, the following. Uh, when Under Secretary Hill and the US delegation finally talk later this week with Abdel Karim Hashim, Dr. Abdel Karim Hashim is the head of the Iraqi delegation, and members of the Iraq delegation, in concrete terms, what would be, you envision to be the shared gains for both sides, especially on security matters, to sustain the process over the next few months? Well, this is a very good question, and I think this is what I said earlier. Uh, this is what the first 15 minutes is going to be. How is this dialogue going to go? For us, I think when I uh, met Dr. Abdul Karim Hashim, uh, he was prepared with his team. Uh, his team is, is definitely going out with concrete proposal, and those proposals are going to be put on the table for the American side, and then we are going to listen from the American side to see what type of proposal they have. I think the final uh, uh, output of this talk, which is going to be a few hours, it's going to be a communique. And I'm also, like you, waiting to see what is the output of this uh, a communique looks like and what is going to be in that communique, and what are the next steps uh, going forward. Thank you, and we hope that uh, we, when we see that communique, we will see a clear roadmap, if not what uh, was aimed to be accomplished now, but at least with the plan to accomplish in the long term, uh, as we um, hope that this is going to be finally a, a dialogue 
uh, to work for a strategy and strategic relations. This question I was going to ask, but I knew that it would come from the audience, so I left it. Uh, when the U.S. returned to Iraq along with multinational forces uh, for the fight against ISIS, did Iraq ratify a new status of forces agreement? I understand, the questioner says, I understand this was uh, before your term in the ministry, but what do you know about that? And if not, did Iraq ratify a new SOFA during uh, Adel Abdel Mahdi's term? This is particularly significant considering current U.S.-Iran conflict on Iraqi soil. Well, uh, the, the, the troops are actually, uh, it was, uh, uh, they came, yes, it is before my term, and right. uh, they were invited by the Iraqi government be after uh, you know, the occupation of Mosul and other cities uh, by ISIS. And that's where the coalition started. Uh, uh, we don't have a sofa with the, with the U.S., but we do have uh, what's called a letter of, uh, uh, you know, um, invitation to, uh, to the international community to assist Iraq, uh, provided that uh, the sovereignty of Iraq would be uh, uh, respected and uh, everything would be under uh, uh, the sovereignty of Iraq, which is important in this. And two letters that's been submitted to the United Nations by uh, Foreign Minister Hoshar Zubari and Foreign Minister Jaffari is we requested assistance from the international community. That's where the US and the multinational came to Iraq to help us according to that letter of agreement. But it's not a SOFA, it's not a status of force agreement. And no, Adel Abdel Mahdi has not signed anything uh, as called the SOFA with the United States. Thank you. That's very helpful to know. Uh, it's a question that people always ask. In fact, it crossed my mind to ask you. I have a question from uh, uh, Mr. Majid Jafar, who sends you his regards. Um, and uh, he says, uh, how, in your opinion, can Iraq tackle the root cause of the fiscal crisis and corruption? which is the, that government appointments at all levels, um, not just ministers, has been uh, over by the uh, separate parties under the Muhasasa system, that's the political apportionment, leading to unsustainable growth of the public sector payroll and ca no capacity of our investment or effective government. What, in other words, the root causes, uh, are they being identified and are they going to be tackled rather than just going after the symptoms? Well, my, my best regard to uh, my friend Majid as well. Um, I think this is a very important question, and this is uh, better for Ali Alawi, uh, that uh, Minister Alawi of Finance, that uh, than me. But I think uh, what we try to do in our government is trying to figure out if we could develop a private sector strategy to work a little bit uh, with the government on what's called the PPP, public and private uh, partnership. Uh, but uh, the root causes is so deep and it needs really time as well as strong effort and strong uh, legislation from parliament to eliminate, at least to limit uh, the number of uh, issues that we have uh, on the fiscal uh, uh, policies that we have. And this is really very important for us um, and we try to sort of figure out how do we diverse our revenues instead of getting it uh, only from oil, and uh, we try to sort of figuring out how do we do that. Um, so far, uh, it's been a very difficult road, a very challenging road on this path. Um, thank you. Uh, a question from... Um, uh Dr. Faisal Astarabadi, Ambassador Astarabadi asks, uh, what are Iraq's strategic objectives as you see them in the dialogue between the U.S. and Iraq? Relatedly, how would you get the American side to stop thinking of Iraq mainly through, perspective, uh, through the perspective of its Iran policy? Yes. Uh, well, well, again, uh, my best regard to my friend, and colleague uh, Faisal Estrabadi is an ambassador that I respect tremendously and uh, continuously. I think his, his question is very important. And this is what we try to do 
is to look at Iraq as a country not only attached sort of to the policy of Iran. And we tried with the U.S. to uh, let them know that this is uh, an important for us. Otherwise, we will always uh, get uh, this stigma of having to uh, sort of uh, uh, getting the Iraqi uh, uh, always cited by the Iranian. Uh, but the Iraqi is an Arab country, has an Arab uh, policy, has also uh, a foreign policy uh, relation with, uh, with um, Turkey, with, with all of the countries beside us, as well as Iran. Iran is an important uh, neighbor. But it's also we have neighbors like Turkey, we have neighbors like Arab neighbors. So our our Iraq has to be uh, taken by the U.S. And this dialogue will emphasize the relationship between the U.S. and Iraq as a state, uh, not as a, a surrogate state, which is uh, uh, what uh, I think my friend Faisal is is trying to sort of uh, say. How do we get the American to understand Iraq as in Iraq rather than? Uh, Iraq is attached to the policy of Iran. We want to be distinguished uh, with re our relationship with, with the U.S. as an Iraq relationship to the U.S., not a U.S. relationship to Iran. And then here comes the Iraqis in the between uh, this side. So this is a big difficult issue, but it has to be done through the dialogue and through the conversation we have. And I think uh, we have uh, told uh, uh, foreign minister statement, you know, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo on this several times, and we have mentioned that Iraq is, is uh, 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 a country that has uh, its own policies and its all uh, its own uh, uh, you know uh, strategic uh, work that needs to do with uh, partners, and that's why we are partnering with the U.S. and we we feel it is uh, a strategic partner. This is a question not much in foreign policy, but also uh, related to how the government runs and it influences everything, including the way foreign policy is run. It says, it has been uh, noted that part of Iraq's struggle with the democratic transition, uh, it has been a lack of government oversight with structural institutions in place to carry out this function. An example of this would be the, need, uh, the needless and some might say fraudulent spending on the military through ghost employees. Has Parliament uh, ever considered creating a commission to review labor registries? Or what else might be done to curb this type of spending in a country that desperately needs to efficiently maximize its oil revenues and uh, the displacement of these uh, disbursement, sorry, of these of these uh, revenues, and if I may attach to the question, something is basically that this has been a, a question that has that was was mentioned often, uh, probably in his first statement after taking office. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi talked about ghost employees, not just in the military, as the questioner would ask, but also uh, the, uh, the in the. Um, and the civilian side, also a question that came up during the negotiations over paying on payments of salaries between Baghdad and Erbil, uh, where uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister um, uh, Haider al-Abadi um, insisted on full uh, review of the register of, of the employees before uh, salaries were paid. Uh, and and uh, also, I assume that in your government, you followed on, on, on those footsteps as well. No, this is a very, very important question. I think uh, Prime Minister Adha Abdel Mahdi uh, insisted from the first meeting uh, of, of uh, the Council of Ministers on <clears throat> bringing uh, what is called the new methodology of paying salaries, which is every government employee, whether it's a Minister of Interior, Ministry of Defense, even Foreign Ministry, has to register and get an ID and also has an account number. And then all of the money would be transferred for the salaries at the end of the month to that automatically to that account. So we will eliminate all the ghost employees and there is no cash uh, in terms of paying salaries. And this is really the payment. And I think it is right. I think uh, they are doing the same thing now with, with the KRG region to make sure that their payments are going uh, uh, electronically and through the bank accounts of every employee with employee ID. For instance, uh, uh, 
uh, Iraqi ministers like uh, the foreign minister, the interior minister, and defense ministers are now all electronic transfer from Minister of Finance rather than paying cash to uh, you know uh, the salary at the end of the month. All right. Speaking of uh, of the uh, oh, uh, just uh, part of the question that I would like to remind your Excellency about is. Uh, has there been an effort in the parliament or maybe in the uh, council of ministers to establish that kind of a commission to do a full review of of iraq in terms of the uh, the registry of employees uh, and and this is again I, the reason i'm emphasizing it is because it uh, it is an issue for iraq whether it is the role the payroll of, of the employees, the payroll of the military, the payroll of even the social welfare and the safety net that is given to certain families in hardship. And, you know, the government sometimes announces, now this is, again, not in Iraq, only in Iraq, even here in the United States, we have some, you know, big, big issues with it, but certainly in Iraq, it sticks out. Um, has there been an effort to establish such a commission and do it, or is there anything that you would advise that they would do that you might, you know, have thought of your own on how to do it best? Well, I think uh, 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 Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi has established an, a commission uh, to fight corruption, and I think this is part of it. Uh, in terms of figuring out ghost employees and so on, I'm not aware of that, but I think it is necessary uh, with electronic and ID uh, identification for every employee. I think this should be able to, uh, you know, to sort of eliminate a lot of people who receive salaries on the side rather than, uh, uh, or multiple salaries at the same time. They could be registered in multiple places, but uh, that would be eliminated because of the government ID uh, and, and so on. Uh, and I think it, if it's not there, uh, probably uh, the Commission for Fighting Corruption if it's going to tackle this issue or not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we hope that it will be, especially now uh, with the uh, plan that uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, uh, our friend Professor Ali Allawi, has put forward to uh, work on Iraqi economy. It's a, it's a gutsy plan, uh, but it is going to be a painful plan in some of its items. And I think it is important that uh, it you know, it's, it's overdue that it is done by the Iraqi government because the alternative would be probably having to work under complete collapse if, uh, you know, Iraq doesn't tackle these issues while still there is a chance. Um, but uh, that would be one way to look at it as part of this new plan to overhaul the Iraqi economy. And now they are looking for any way to save expenses, eliminate unnecessary spending and on all of that. Uh, Two questions I would like to combine. Uh, some of these questions I don't mention the person that uh, asked because it is a, doesn't show up on my screen. Some people enter as anonymous, uh, and anonymous people are to, to uh, refer to by name uh, uh, through the computer. Uh, uh, Ambassador Mushira uh, Khattab from Egypt uh, says the following. Um, uh, let me pick the question a little bit longer. It says, uh, I, I took part uh, in, as a speaker in a virtual roundtable a few days ago on the socioeconomic and, uh, repercussions of COVID-19 in the Arab world. Among the speakers, two from Iraq. Uh, I sense discrepancies in the COVID-19 pandemic between the Kurdish and Arab areas. If this is a reality, what are the reasons and how is the uh, national response uh, targeting such disparities uh, has been? Uh, another question that is related uh, is um, from Mr. Kamal Unal, uh, who says, do you think that the cooperation um, re in relation to uh, COVID-19 between Kurdish region and uh, Baghdad central government or Iraq central government sufficient? Well, this is, is good questions. Both of them are actually excellent questions. We follow the results coming out from uh, the commission of uh, 55, which is uh, uh, a commission established by the Prime Minister uh, Abdel Mahdi and led by uh, the health minister. And it has a member from KRG. So KRG is a member of this uh, central commission and they report as well as 
they uh, take all of the initiatives uh, they, uh, and they participate as well in the High Commission uh, uh, of uh, COVID. And I, I, I am not aware of uh, the differences, but the numbers are there. Uh, the Ministry of Health receives all of the numbers from KRG, as well as other, uh, 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 you know, uh, provinces in Iraq, and they publish them daily. Uh, whether, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the health and, and the KRG is different, uh, and, and also the restrictions as well as the requirements is being uh, uh, considered in KRG different from the rest of Iraq. Uh, maybe, but there are a lot of provinces in Iraq as well have lower than the south and the middle, Baghdad uh, and KRG themselves, like Nainawa, and Ambar, Tikrit, and uh, Kirkuk. They are very uh, limited number of cases that we uh, uh, usually, and Diala as well, uh, that we report every day. And I look at the uh, every daily daily report from this this commission. This commission is 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 a central commission and KRG is a member of this commission, and they also follow uh, all of the instructions that coming out from this particular one. Um, so the cooperation, I think, is there, and uh, the daily cooperation between them. Uh, also, equipments that is coming, the kits, the testing kits and others, it will be distributed to all the provinces, including the KRG region, so they are not excluded from these kits. Uh, as a matter of fact, and all of the medical uh, equipment are going uh, to from Basra to Mosul by the central government, as I uh, I envision it, uh, because I'm not member of uh, this commission, but I know that this commission is central commission. Great, uh, thank you. The coming one is a very good question, and also like all of these questions, I'm having a hard time picking which questions to answer uh, to ask uh, to your excellency. And there are many questions, and I hope that we will follow up with the people that ask these questions later. Um, so, uh, uh, it says the following. Do you think that the time for a dialogue with the United States is appropriate at this time? Because, as you know, the United States has a new election in coming months, November well, and uh, Kazemi's government uh, it's like an interim government, and its main mission is preparing for a new elections in Iraq. Well, that remains to be seen, and I would like to hear your views on that as well, as whether or not we will have an election. So why dialogue now? Do you think uh, the uh, Iraqi decision makers should be patient? Because the Trump administration has had experience with agreements like what happened uh, in, in, uh, with other countries. So, you know, is it appropriate to have it now or is it more prudent to wait until, you know, uh, a new administration in both capitals uh, take place? Well, I, I think the dialogue is continuous. I don't think there is really any harm of uh, not having a dialogue with the U.S. because of the situation. Uh, I think it, it is appropriate and I think it's timely as well because, uh, because our relationship uh, went into sort of the quiet mood and we went to sort of reinvigorate this uh, conversation with the U.S. Uh, I have visited the Washington three times when I was a uh, foreign minister and we trying to sort of work through the issues and I think it is very appropriate for us at this point and Kadhani's government for us in Iraq, uh, it, it is a continuation to Adel Abdel Mehdi government and this dialogue and partnership with the U.S. is a street strategic partnership as well as its important partnership. So um, I don't think that both election, whether it's in Iraq or, or, or in the US, is going to be uh, you know, uh, a stepping uh, stone for uh, not, uh, you know, uh, or a stoppage to uh, the dialogue between the two of us. It's very healthy to dialogue with, with the US to put all of the issues on the table and figure out what we're gonna do next. And this, these are the important issues. How do we resolve certain issues? Uh, the security is one part. But the other part, as you mentioned, there are a lot of sectors on technology, on education, or economic, on health, as well as uh, on issues of co cooperation and finance. And these are all important to Iraq. It is from our point of view, it's very important. And I think we value the dialogue with the US at this point. Well said, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, let me ask you, uh, 
this question from uh, our friend, Dr. Nisai Bayounis. So despite over a decade of lobbying, it remains incredibly difficult to get visas for companies looking to invest in Iraq and for NGOs trying to support the country. Uh, why is that? Uh, and I know that the Iraqi government sometimes talks about this uh, often. So I would really like to hear uh, your views on that and what can be done to uh, make that easier. Well, this is really, uh, the foreign ministry has a small part of the issuing the visa. And it is here in Iraq, it's a bit com it's similar to the US. Uh, the visas are not really issued. It's, it's been stamped by uh, uh, the embassies, but at the same time, the decision is being by the interior ministry. So uh, it is a sort of a dialogue continuously. For business people, I think we have uh, given the ambassadors, and I hope that the ambassador uh, Farid Yassin is on, online with us and listening. He is being given a task of allowing and, and giving a lot of uh, leeway to give uh, uh, visas to uh, uh, investors coming to Iraq. And we encourage that, as a matter of fact. We want investors to come to Iraq and we want them to come and see the opportunities here. Uh, in terms of NGOs, uh, that is also uh, requires some uh, regulations here uh, to give uh, visas to. But I think at the end of the day, uh, with a work with the ambassador in Washington, uh, or in, in different uh, uh, places should be able to uh, get a visa to Iraq. Uh, thank you very much. And I know that uh, from being in Washington that we could always uh, uh, talk to Ambassador Farid Yassin and he has been a great asset for Iraq and for anybody who deals with the embassy, um, a, a great diplomat and, and a, 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 an intellectual in his own right. So this is you know, one of the uh, good things that that we deal with here uh, in with the Iraqi embassy, and it's we hope that uh, he is listening. And uh, you know this, is, but this is again, it's an issue. I think a lot of it has to do with also the um, the regulations and the laws. Iraq still has a uh, cumulative uh, set of rules and regulations. Some of them predate even two thousand three. And that, you know, and not to mention the bureaucratic process, et cetera. So, but we hope that it will be uh, uh, taken um, into, into consideration. Uh, a question from uh, Dr. Hisham Al Alawi. Uh, he is the ambassador of Iraq to the Netherlands. And uh, he says, uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you uh, for your valuable services to our ministry at very challenging times, given the importance of the dialogue between Iraq and the US, um, and the nature of the challenges facing the Iraqi government. Does His Excellency support the suggestion to elevate the ranking of the Iraqi negotiation team and ask His Excellency Dr. Ali Alawi, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance to lead them? Uh, so if you can just uh, maybe talk to us about First of all, your views on that, since you are involved in setting up the team from the beginning. Also, what protocols requires and all of that, given what the U.S. decided in terms of a delegation. Well, this is really a very good question, and, and it's uh, it, it's good to hear from uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Hisham Al Alawi, Ambassador Hisham. He's a friend and his colleague uh, as well. We worked together uh, when we were ambassadors, and uh, as well as the foreign minister. I think this is a very good question. Uh, the SFA uh, started uh, as a strategic framework uh, with a meeting at the highest level, which is at the foreign minister level every six months. And it it's supposed to be alternate uh, meeting, one, uh, uh, once in, in, in Washington DC and the other time is in Baghdad. So at the level of the foreign minister, uh, that is the level that is the negotiation. But this dialogue in particular, to start the dialogue, I think it was uh, uh, decided to be at the deputy uh, foreign minister, uh, so we could set up uh, uh, the issues that we need to talk about going forward. But I think one of the key issues is that this particular dialogue has to be set at the foreign minister level, and then it has to be set every six months, alternate, once in DC and once in Baghdad, 
and uh, with teams at the highest level, including the finance, including uh, energy, uh, Ministry of Energy and, and other ministries. So yes, the level is important, but to start the dialogue, I think at this point, this level is very good to start the sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the things rolling here. Great. Uh, another great question here uh, that is out of the um, direct, uh, work of the ministry, but also it is something that the ministry has been at the heart of. Uh, you mentioned agriculture reform. Uh, 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 you mentioned agriculture agri should be agricultural reform uh, earlier uh, in uh, the dialogue. There have been several reports that the Tigris and Euphrates water levels in Iraq uh, that are diminishing and will continue to do so in the future. This is due to climate change and upstream dams in Turkey and Syria, along with uh, other factors. What are some ideas for curbing the diminishing water stream um, flow, uh, which is necessary for Iraqi farmers and public in general? This is a very good question, and this is what I said earlier, that one of the uh, um, issues and priorities uh, that for the foreign ministry is to make sure that we have a dialogue with uh, Turkey as well uh, on these issues and uh, the issue of water, and we continuously have uh, a dialogue with Turkey. Uh, and yes, it is an, uh, important for the future, uh, the level of uh, uh, waters coming through uh, the Tigris as well as the Euphrates. Um, so far, the past two years, we were blessed with a lot of rains and a lot of capacity of stored uh, water. It's more than uh, 9 uh, uh, billion cubic meters of water was stored in Iraq in the past two years. And that allowed us to sort of farm a lot of lands and uh, use that uh, uh, access of water that came into us in the past two years. But and we are dealing with Turkey very well on this issue and we are working with them, but it is an issue for the future. And I think uh, uh, we are working uh, to make sure that this is, this is two things. It's a technical issue and it's political issues. And we have to combine both the technical and the political side on, on the water issue. Uh, and, and speaking of Turkey, uh, how do you describe now the relations um, between Iraq and Turkey and on the critical issues? Uh, there are several things. Water is certainly one of those, but also there are a couple of other situations. Uh, one of them is the question of the Turkish troops uh, that were stated, uh, st stationed in Iraq, uh, northern Iraq and Bashirpa for a while. Also the uh, recent uh, interest in, uh, of, of Turkey in the areas that are around the border of uh, uh, the Iraqi Syria and border um, with, with support of certain uh, militant groups uh, and also combating others. Um, I know that the, uh, the, the ambassador uh, is hardworking. You have good relation with, the, with, the, with your counterpart when you were in, uh, in the ministry. And uh, so many other good things were going on. But where is the status right now between Iraq and Turkey? Do you describe it in the positive, in the positive but challenging, or something else? Uh, because Turkey is a very important neighbor of Iraq and a key player in the region. It, it is indeed. And I, and I continue to emphasize the, the value of the relationship with Turkey. Yes, we do have issues, and these issues could be resolved. Uh, sitting on the table. We have met with them at the highest level, at the foreign minister level several times, and then also combined minister, defense, as well as uh, security. And uh, we are uh, working on what is called an, uh, uh, an understanding paper uh, on these three issues. The issue uh, on uh, water, uh, issue on uh, the troops in Bashika, and uh, the issue of the PKK. Uh, and these are uh, uh, underway, and we started the work uh, uh, with Molu Chawishoglu and, and uh, with their defense minister and then with the security intelligence as well. Um, we know there are challenging issues with them, border issues, but on the other hand, uh, 
the strength of the relationship between Iraq and Turkey is on the commercial side. And today the trade between Iraq and Turkey is about $12 billion. And we need to increase that trade to become $20 billion. And we also wanted Iraq to be a transit uh, 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 country where the goods coming in from Turkey to the Gulf and it goes in to uh, uh, the GCC countries, which is a, a very short uh, distance. And this is what we are working on. So there are a lot of things are we on the positive side, uh, commercial, uh, trade, as well as we work on water. Uh, President Orlupan has assigned one of his strong friends who understand water very well to be his envoy of water to Iraq and work on strategy with Iraq. So there is tremendous dialogue on this. And uh, as well as we trying to build a relationship with them based on trust and based on uh, the issue of uh, benefit for both countries. Now, uh, just to pick up on a few things that you mentioned uh, the, the, um, in the uh, time of government uh, of Adil Abdel Mahdi, we had uh, many agreements that were made with neighboring countries. Uh, that goes to again to the heart of the approach Iraq has taken to uh, solve as many regional issues as possible and turn uh, the page on past uh, heartaches and also look for the future, and which was a very good approach that helped Iraq in, in a way. Uh, and so I recall that uh, there was a um, uh, major agreement with Jordan, and I know that uh, you have a very good relation with your uh, friend, uh, Mr. Safadi, the, the foreign minister, and, and, and you know, probably following your Twitter account, you have more phone calls uh, you know, with, with, with him than many other uh, foreign ministers. Uh, and that's very appropriate because Jordan is very important. It is a neighboring country. There is a lot of history, but also trade on other things with Jordan. Saudi has been a, a, a major development that was the opening of crossing, uh, border crossings and for commercial and for others. And I believe that you also managed to secure some better uh, uh, agreements on exchange with business and visas and, and uh, even more uh, traffic between the two countries. Uh, now, Iran, even though the relation was um, stronger than, than other neighboring countries, but there were major agreements on Shat al-Arab, and which is an issue that was uh, that brought a lot of catastrophes to the two countries. And that was a lot of uh, positive. And more importantly, I think, another, another turning of the page that is very important was the special relation with Kuwait. Uh, and probably I will ask about that. So, uh, these are things that were looking very good uh, at the time that, that were concluded. What is the timeline for these to kick in? That's my question, really. Uh, and we see the benefits from all of these. Now, sometimes when a government does something, there are two concerns. One, you want to take credit for it. Another, which is how a statesman looks like, you know, for uh, the issues, is to think that how the countries will be, or, or their country will benefit from it in the long run, even if they are not around office to take credit for it. So when will good historians give you credit for these things uh, when they start? What is the timeline for them to do fruits? Yeah, I, I thank, thank you for, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the description of, of the relationship. Uh, but these are very important. I think once uh, uh, the president, President uh, Barham Saleh and Prime Minister, uh, Abdel Mahdi, uh, they made sure to visit our neighboring countries and make sure that we will open up a new uh, segment of relationship with them. And the Saudis were very important. We went to Saudi Arabia, uh, we went to Kuwait, uh, Tehran, as well as to uh, Istanbul and Ankara. We visited them and we visited Amman as well. So Amman was a very crucial uh, country to work with. Uh, from the Arab country, we also both uh, the prime minister uh, as well as uh, the foreign minister went into Egypt as well and made sure that the relationship with Egypt is very important. Uh, in terms of signing MOUs, we have not only start, signed the MOUs, but we started working on these MOUs. And the first uh, uh, things that uh, Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi and did with Omar Razaz, Prime Minister of uh, uh, Jordan, Jordan. Industrial. Uh, zone 
on the border. And this is yes. really the first path. Now all of the trucks are coming from both sides. They will go to the industrial zone and they work from there very quickly with very little uh, time spent on visas and so on. All the truck drivers have multiple visas on their passports. They don't stop. They just pass through uh, uh, the zone and they just move on uh, very quickly from one side to another. Uh, the same thing with the Saudis. We opened up, uh, 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 you know, we had a free zone agreement with them and opened up an industrial zone uh, on the border. And we are working the same thing. Uh, President Rouhani, when he visited Baghdad, he said very uh, 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 frankly to uh, Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi, he said, you have a lot of experience in opening an industrial zone. We wanted to open that between Iraq and Iran and make sure that the industry will flourish between Iraq and Iran on this side. So there are a lot of benefits going forward for the foreign minister and then also for the industrials and the finance minister to work through these MOUs that's been signed between Iraq, Kuwait, as well as Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, and Iraq, Turkey to continue with that. We also strengthened our relationship uh, 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 through the Arab country as well. I think uh, the agreement between Iraq, Jordan, and Egypt is very good. Is the understanding is where Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi made sure that the first visit he goes to was to uh, Cairo, to visit Cairo, and yes. meet with King Abdullah and meet with uh, uh, President Sisi. And that was an excellent meeting there. And we prepared these visits uh, ahead by the foreign minister and uh, the, uh, the meeting with the intelligence, the free intelligence, head of intelligence uh, that they met uh, in, in Cairo. So these are the issues that we're trying to sort of work through. And uh, we, we try to sort of uh, make sure that we organize our plans to work with the neighboring countries. That's why, why I said at the beginning, the plan is very simple. The priority is our neighboring countries and then also the Arab uh, region as well the Gulf and the Arab region, including Egypt, which is Egypt is very important. Uh, great. And now speaking of that, uh, there, there is a, uh, uh, and, and this is a question really for myself. Uh, there is uh, always uh, the uh, Arab countries refer to the new era as the uh, uh, Iraq returned to the Arab world. My question to you, has Iraq ever departed from the Arab world or did the Arab world depart from Iraq um, in, in the past? How do you view that? Well, that's the, all the question is, is uh, it's been answered several times. Iraq has Who never- Who is coming been, back to whom? Iraq has never ever departed from the Arab uh, uh, region at all of the Arab world. And Iraq will be always a strong member, very active member and very valuable member to the Arab. And uh, Iraq had the opportunity to lead uh, uh, the Council of for the Foreign Minister of the Arab League and for six months. And we led it with, with really very uh, uh, hard uh, uh, way by supporting Palestine, by supporting the issues uh, and the Palestinian issues. And, and uh, we are supporting the Arab uh, causes uh, everywhere. So. Let me give you a breather with this question. It's easy, but it's hard as well. Uh, but I know that, uh, you know, you like to talk about it because you and I discussed it back in April, I believe. Uh, a good question from uh, Alan Makovsky. He says, Iraq is a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional nation, of course. To what extent, if at all, did you try to develop a pluralistic diplomatic cadre in the foreign ministry? And I really want you to give us the full account of what very few people know. This is really very important question. Thank you, Alan, for this question. I think I think what one thing I, I tried to do when during my tenure at the foreign ministry is to work on this issue uh, very carefully and 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 it's systematically as well. And I think both ministers, Minister uh, Hoshar Zubari as well as Minister Jaffari, try their best to include all of ethnics. One thing in, in, that, in the foreign ministry is we take people uh, really uh, on, on, on their uh, merit and, uh, uh, and uh, their expertise and uh, we train them well. Uh, uh, and, and a very good example is uh, uh, the last selection that I did of ambassadors. 
when we put everyone, every uh, 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 higher senior, uh, um, you know, uh, ministry uh, diplomat, we put them through uh, a very rigorous uh, yes. sort of group that they went through and they went and then figure out what, what is the best person to be available for this particular uh, post, whether that person is uh, um, qualified, whether he is, we didn't even look at ethnics at all. We just said, is this person qualified or not? So we worked very hard and especially in my tenure to make sure that uh, women, men, uh, there's no discrimination as well. Uh, there are 40% of uh, foreign uh, of diplomats in uh, and the foreign ministry are women actually, which is very good. And then also in terms of uh, ethnically, they are all diversified. It's one of the uh, best ministries that you could find, you know, uh, diversity in the, in, in terms of uh, uh, diplomatic staff. Well, I, I will I will just follow up on one thing here, and and I, again, uh, I was privileged to to follow closely all of what you described, and I can uh, testify to that uh, effort, which is uh, I think. It has not been done uh, in the history of the ministry before you, or Excellency, has instituted it. It's very important. But uh, there, is, there are a couple of things that make the question important and this process important and what you try to do. First of all, uh, it is a, not just any ministry. Uh, this is a ministry that is highly uh, specialized. Um, not anybody or everybody can be a diplomat. And it is not... To be in the ministry is not an entitlement, uh, it has to be earned. But on the other hand, it's a very important uh, endeavor and noble uh, effort to make sure that everybody who is qualified uh, gets there. And we have, with the history of this ministry, you and I are both Iraqis and we grew up in, in both uh, eras and um, before the 2003 and after 2003. Um, Unlike most Iraqis, Iraq is a beyond demographic, uh, but 60% of Iraqis don't have a personal memory of pre-2003 pre because they were either born shortly before it or after it. Um, but we are what do they call the Mukhadram, the one who saw the two eras. Um, initially, this ministry was locked into a few cities and few uh, families and this, and it was impossible to get in. And after 2003, uh, while it opened to other people, to, to other ethnicities, to other uh, uh, components of Iraqi diversity, but also uh, the practice of the Iraqi state in general, not just the ministry, was that there was a, the opening war more of to the party diversity rather than to the average Iraqi diversity. And if I recall from our discussion, which was very useful, and uh, I was listening to you talk about your plans, it is not just what's in the ministry and how to promote people within the ministry, but the new classes that are coming to join the ministry. Uh, the, you know, you, you probably, it's very hard to deal with what's in the ministry. You just got the hand you are dealt. These are your cadre and you have to deal with them. But I think you and also the other, the, 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 your successor, Dr. Fouad Hussain, need to probably uh, focus on that as well. The new classes have to be uh, diversif diversified and reflect uh, Iraq as we know it, not just the parties of Iraq or certain groups of Iraq. And I remember that you mentioned that you are trying to allocate uh, some of these, these seats within the embassy or the opportunities by provinces or, you know, just the way parliament is selected and others and, and make it more competitive and make it more sort of uh, transparent. So qualified people rather than well-recommended people will get in. Did you have a chance after we spoke, and I know your period was very short in that uh, in, in office, did you, did you get at least some of that? Was there a class that entered after we spoke or not yet or... How, is it going to be carried on? Is there a saying that you have to make sure that this will be uh, implemented after you left office? I'll give you a very quick update on this. We have advertised uh, for, um, you know, as you said, top top level from university graduates uh, and, and multiple uh, sort of uh, uh, specialties, specifically that's related to the foreign uh, service specialties. 
and we have uh, put a plan to accept people from provinces, as you said, to make sure that everybody is being sort of, uh, uh, as you said, in parliament is being uh, represented from Mosul to Basra as well. Uh, we had uh, planned for 120 seats in, in the institutions, in the foreign institute, and applied about 19,000 people applied to this. And it was really fantastic. Uh, we extend the applications uh, another uh, from a month to 45 days because a lot of people applied. And then now we have uh, uh, found that 5,000 of them are most qualified, or at least qualified, and we're going to put them through tests. And uh, from there, we will uh, select 400 of those 5,000 for interviews, and then we will take 120 of them for the final uh, institute. So, and and we have uh, uh, we have honestly, we from every province, we have people who applied and they are qualified. We are so happy to get that type of response uh, from PhDs and master degrees and and bachelor degrees. And I think the competition is going to be. Uh, uh, tremendous. And we're going to have a very good selection of 120 people uh, that represent Iraq to in total. That's wonderful. Uh, let me ask uh, this question, and uh, you know, we are doing well with time. Uh, they, uh, it says, uh, Minister Al-Hakim mentioned earlier that it is challenging to influence the current U.S. administration to deal with Iraq as a state and not through the lens of its current zero-sum policy with Iran. The upcoming strategic framework dialogue represents an opportunity to initiate a step towards this end. In your opinion, what's Iraq's leverage over the U.S.? Are there any initiatives to make uh, the status of uh, what strategic framework agreement a sustainable agreement that won't be deactivated when governments change in both countries? Well, I, I think it is because it's been since 2008 and government has also changed in both countries. And uh, we continue the dialogue and uh, uh, we will continue the dialogue. I think this dialogue is very important is the start of a very comprehensive dialogue. As I said, the dialogue has never stopped between the two sides. It continues, and uh, especially in my term as well, when I was in, in uh, at the ministry. And this dialogue will set up, uh, you know, the process going forward, regardless of who's going to be, you know, uh, in government. Election is going to happen in both countries, in Iraq and in the U.S., and government's going to change. And this is, uh, you know, uh, this is a fact of life. And what we end up do is make sure that what we signed on on 2008, we could take forward and make sure that we could adjust it as we go forward and what type of things that we uh, need to do. As I said, initially, we thought that this would be at the foreign minister level and alternate meetings every six months to review the progress that we are doing uh, and from both sides, once in DC and once in Baghdad. And this will continue whether the government is going to continue in DC or the government is going to continue in Baghdad. It is going to be a process, I hope, that we will uh, initiate that. But uh, on the 11th, the first 15 minutes are the first crucial, is how do we think we proceed, we should proceed going forward on this SFA uh, between the two countries. Okay, well, uh, definitely uh, there is a lot of hard work, a lot of um, candid dialogue that needs to take, to take place and, and people um, need to realize that, uh, you know, which is what we always emphasize here in Washington, that there needs to be an Iraq policy for the sake of Iraq uh, because there's a lot. Uh, Iraq has been always and will continue to be an important player and regional uh, country in, in the Middle East. And uh, we hope that we see strategic relations thrive and, and become more robust. Uh, a good question on something that uh, was happening during the um, uh, tenure of uh, the Adunadi's government, uh, which is 
the exemption of uh, certain products from Jordan uh, in uh, get coming into Iraq. Now, uh, the question says, what was the commercial and or political gain by Iraqi government, industry, uh, or people um, from exempting about a couple of hundred Jordanian products from any custom duties? If I may editorialize the question uh, there is, uh, or add a little bit to it. Um, this is a big issue right now, especially because of the movement inside Iraq to talk about uh, uh, protecting and promoting Iraqi uh, products. Uh, and also, uh, I don't believe that only Jordan has been the place where you know, there was a policy to exempt products from several uh, origins, but I would like to, David, for you to tell us the scope, but the question really of looking at what is the political philosophy and also the, 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 the uh, economic philosophy for that decision that was taken uh, and uh, uh, at the time? Oh, well, I think this is very important to establish a relationship with Jordan. Jordan is really uh, an important country for Iraq. Uh, in terms of establishing exemption for certain uh, products, first of all, we put certain limits on the number of products and then also the type of products. And I think the Ministry of Industry has gone to the factories and, and checked to make sure that these are Jordanian products. They are not labeled Jordanian products. They are not imported products and then labeled and repackaged in Jordan. So that's one thing. Uh, there are also exempted products from Iraq to Jordan and in return. So there is really uh, a relationship which is both way, not, not only one way. Our products be exported to Jordan, as well as product from Jordan coming in to Iraq. And this is also to help, uh, without any doubt, the Jordanian economy. And this is important for us as well to help. We are a uh, consumer society. We also are trying to protect our uh, local industries. And we did very well in terms of uh, protecting uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the smaller manufacturing industry here in Iraq, especially in the food industry as well and in, in the other products. And every time the Minister of, of, of Industry brought in a product that we need to uh, work on and protect in Iraq, we have actually issued uh, an agreement to him on that side. So I think it's, it works both ways and it is important for us to help Jordan as well uh, as uh, getting the products that are uh, you know, uh, uh, manufactured in, in Jordan. Very well said. Thank you. Um, now, uh, let me uh, ask you uh, the uh, here. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, we've got. Are we on? Okay. We are out of time. Uh, it has been uh, a wonderful uh, journey. Uh, with you, uh, Your Excellency, and uh, always uh, it's never uh, letting us uh, down because we have the highest expectations of, of, from a conversation like this, and you always exceed them. So uh, what is next for you? Let's get an exclusive here. <laughs> well, you know, I think at this, at this stage of my life, uh, probably will uh, uh, rest a little bit and uh, relax and uh, spend some time with the family and uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, take some tours into places that I always enjoy to go to. Um, no UN uh, uh, involvement back because you, you uh, really had or other uh, regional or international organizations that uh, we can uh, you know, talk about or even within Iraqi uh, politics. Well, let's put it that way. I think uh, the next steps would be probably to rest a little bit. And uh, there are some offers from institutions and research groups to, uh, you know, work part time with them and, and we'll see how it works. But uh, I have plenty of, uh, of time to think about that uh, going forward. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, you will be an asset uh, and a tremendous contributor wherever you are uh, and uh, it, it has always been an honor to uh, know you to call your friend 
And also, thank you for your uh, service in a very great time um, in Iraq and, and, and a challenging time. Not just I'm referring to your position at the foreign minister, but also all of the other uh, list of distinguished positions that you had uh, as an educator, as a diplomat, as an elected official, uh, and as an intellectual. Thank you very much, and we always look forward to uh, talking to you. Uh, you are always welcome to the Atlantic Council whenever you uh, come to Washington, and uh, we would love to see you, host you, and, and talk to you. And certainly, uh, it is. Uh, we look forward to, to more insight from you in, in the future. I also would like to thank uh, all of those who joined us. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Uh, uh, we hope that everybody uh, stay safe and uh, wish you all the best um, uh, and to your families as well. Thank you and uh, please continue to join us for our excellent events at the Iraq Initiative and the Atlantic Council at large. Um, your Excellency, it's been an honor. Thank you. If Thank there's you. any word you want to say. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Really Thank appreciate you very much. Hosting me. Thank you. All the best. Look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.